My name is Kate McCarthy. I'm the chair of the Montpelier Development Review Board, and I'd like to call this meeting to order. The date is July 6th, um, 2020, and it is 7 o'clock. Um, I'd like to start by introducing the other members of the DRB. So easiest thing to do is I'll just go through names, and if you'd please give a wave, um, we can you can introduce yourself that way. So um, the board members... Uh, listening to hearings tonight are Rob Goodwin. Hey, Rob. Uh, Jean Leon. Roger Cram. Joe Kiernan. Joe. And myself, Kate McCarthy. Um, we also are supported tonight by Meredith Crandall, our zoning administrator, staffing this. Um, this board, um, Cameron Niedermeyer, who is the assistant city manager, is that right, Cameron? Yes, ma'am. Uh, and who is our moderator this evening. And then um, we usually have on, though maybe not tonight, Tammy Furry is our recording secretary um, who, who turns our meetings into minutes. Um, so those are the folks uh, who are staffing and, and hearing the hearing. hearing. Um, so with that, I'd like to turn it over to Meredith, who's going to give a staff review on participation here in this Zoom setting for anyone who might be watching on TV who would like to, to get in on the Zoom call. Yep. Go so ahead, gonna, Meredith. For usual, I'm going to share my screen. Um, this is mostly for those watching via Orca, so they can see the details for how we log in, if they need to. Um, so... Due to the state of emergency, due to the result of the COVID-19 pandemic, and pursuant to Addendum 6 to Executive Order 0120 and 22, the Development Review Board is authorized to meet electronically. Um, in accordance with that 92, there is no physical location to observe and listen contemporaneously to this meeting. However, in accordance with the temporary image the open meeting law, the board is providing public access to the meeting and hosting a video conference meeting, including video and telephone access options via the Zoom platform. There's also additional access to offer to live streaming of the meeting. Um, all members of the board have the ability to communicate at the same time during this meeting through this platform, and the public can and if desired, participate in the meeting in real time by joining the meeting at this link here. Um, or you can also call in the meeting. This phone number, 929-265-6099. Um, in either event, either way of accessing, the main ID is here. Password is here. I'm going to leave this on the screen while I'm going to for anybody trying to access the phone. We previously have noticed to the public of this information for accessing the meeting. Um, in our proposed meeting agenda, and further instructions have been invited on the city's website link here. Um, if any has a problem accessing the meeting, please email the meeting moderator, Cam Niedermeyer, at cniedermeyer at montpelier-vt.org, that email address right there. Um, and then further, if you're taking part of the Zoom meeting and accessing the video conference features or otherwise have questions, you can message Cam through the chat function in Zoom. Um, when you log in the meeting, um, you should have an opportunity to tell the moderator to have a to comment on. Um, already, I know who's not different from the Anglo applicant, but it's for anybody else who might log in. Um, and then when the turn is the public comment on application, which are interested in provides the moderator new members of the public based on the reasons in that application. Um, if you are interested in speaking on something that you didn't previously know that you want to talk about, please raise your hand if you're on the video option, um, or you can state your name if you're unmuted when you have a volume of conversation and city staff will recognize that you can be able to do it, and then you can spot on the chair as you're to participate. Um, yeah, matter will unmute you if you haven't unmuted yourself when it's time to talk. And then, then three to five questions or comments for asking two minutes, unless the chair grants you a special additional time. Um, you know, the Zoom has 
updated in the last several weeks. And some people have versions where they're the only ones that can unmute themselves. So the muting, unmuting feature is a little trickier than it was originally. Um, after you finish talking, your microphone will be muted for you if you haven't muted it yourself. Um, and then the chair will move on to the next person to talk. Um, you can provide additional input later, but only after the chair recognizes you again. If in the event the public is unable to access this meeting, um, and I'm assuming Cameron or I would get notice, somebody would email us or, or otherwise advise us if they're having difficulties, um, or if somebody, you know, internet starts going down, then we will need to continue the meeting to a time and place certain. Please note that all votes taken during this meeting will be done by roll call vote. I will now hand it back over to you, Kate. Great, thank you, Meredith. Um, it looks like you're still having a little trouble with um, connectivity and a lot of what you just shared was rather garbled. Um, so I would just, we caught the part at the end. Um, I would just say if there's anyone needing, uh, wanting to participate on a certain matter, please please let us know by raising your hand. I think um, the, the, the 11 people who are on here now, everyone kind of knows, we're aware of you. <laughs> um, but uh, if, if people have questions, please, please um, let us about process, let us know. We do want to make sure everyone is included. Um, and, and Meredith, if that continues to happen, I don't know if it's a, a bandwidth crunch at City Hall tonight. Um, maybe it's, it could be an issue of a matter of just going off video when you're not um, participating to say that. But that's my best guess. OK. Um, any questions? I miss seeing you. But, um, any questions about what Meredith just um, shared? Okay, all right, great, thank you. So um, we've heard the staff review. The next item on our agenda is the approval of the agenda, which we will do by roll call. Um, but first, are there any modifications to the agenda as printed? Okay, I'll entertain a motion to approve the agenda. I'll move to approve the agenda. Second by Roger, thank you. Second by Rob. I will do a roll call. Um, please say yay or nay. Roger. Yay. Gene. Yay. Rob. Yay. Joe. Yay. And I'm Kate, and I also vote yes to approve the agenda. We have an agenda. Thank you. Um, there are no comments from the chair this evening. So what we will do next is we'll move on to the first item on our agenda, which is a continuation of the application at 260 River Street. We heard from um, we heard about this project on June 15th, um, and we are continuing the application to resolve a few of the outstanding questions. Um, this was not necessarily because there were issues. This was not because there were issues with the application. This is because we had a long meeting last time and decided it would be in everybody's best interest to start fresh today. So thank you very much, um, Alicia, for coming back. Appreciate that a lot. Um, is there anyone new to be heard on this application? Okay. Didn't think so, but I also didn't want to assume. Great. Um, so with that, um, Meredith, would you like to give us a quick overview of where things stand with this application? I can try. Let me know if okay. It's garbled. Okay, so far so good. Okay, awesome. And you know, this way you don't get to all see the funny faces I make, so hey. Um, okay. So uh, for anybody who's looking at the new packet versus the old packet, if anybody needs to know where to find things, you know, whichever packet they're in, I do have notes as to where different sections are in the different packets. Um, if you noticed in the new packet, I didn't actually update the staff report because sim things seemed fairly straightforward here. Um, for the public watching at home, this application um, is for, um, sorry, uh, <laughs> um, addition of a constructing a 7,883 square foot building addition on an existing 12,000 950 square foot building at 260 River Street. This is the former Grossman's Lumber Building, um, along with changes to associated drives, parking, utilities, landscaping, and grading, and changing the use of the parcel to office and automobile, 
automobile repair and service with an accessory use of outdoor storage. Um, we've gone through a lot of the application um, provisions previously, received testimony on those, um, or received additional information at the June 15th hearing. That documentation was added to the end of the packet for this application. All that documentation that came in, including on the um, solar access and shading requirements um, and the um, signed and sealed grading plans for the steep slopes requirements. So my understanding for the things that still might need to be discussed or need official determinations are the preliminary determination regarding whether the proposed use includes the sewer related facility use. Um, number two, whether a pedestrian walkway is required to connect the current internal walkways with the public sidewalk. The applicant addressed this in the application materials, but I don't think there was actually discussion of it during the hearing. Maybe I'm wrong, but I, I tried to go back through all my notes and, and didn't see that. And then again, I think that there was information provided by the applicant regarding why they wanted a waiver of the maximum um, fence height limit in front for front yard fences, but I'm not sure the board actually asked any questions or, or had a, any discussion about that. So I just wanted to make sure that those three issues, the board at least said, we don't have any questions about it. We can make that decision. Um, and as a, a procedural note, um, especially because we do have board members here who haven't necessarily served on the board for very long, um, the board does have the option if it feels like it needs some internal discussion to go into a separate deliberative session on the application, either you know, in the middle of this meeting or after all of the public part has been discussed, including the, the next application. Um, you don't have to do it. That's, that's how you all feel about it. If the board does opt to go into some deliberative session, I do have separate call-in details for that for Zoom access, and we can go into that if we, if we head to that direction. Meredith, this is Cameron. You could also, because we have the waiting room um, installed, we can ask folks who are not on the DRB to just be placed back into a waiting room. They can have executive session, and then we can come back. Yeah. So, with, the, with the ORCA recording and everything, it might be easier just to have the separate call in. I'm not sure. Fair enough. Just let you know. Thank you. Well, good. Thank you. We have technology can help us in a couple of ways with that should board members decide to exercise the option to deliberate in private. Um, but thanks, Meredith. That's a great overview. Um, anything else you wanted to add? Uh, I don't think so, unless you have something in particular. <laughs> Sorry. Nope. No, there wasn't a hint. It wasn't a hint. It was a question. <laughs> Good. Uh, Great. So, uh, five two two zero one five zero. That's Ward Joyce. I just logged on. Awesome. Thank you, Ward. Thank you. Great. So we're commencing. Um, we're we are continuing our review of um, two sixty River Street. First item on our agenda. So now that we've heard a little bit about what we've done so far, here, here's what I'd like to. Here's how I'd like to proceed with this one. Um, I'd like to look at the preliminary questions that are raised on page five and six of the staff report regarding this use, because if we need to decide what the use is in order to determine what standards apply to it. We started talking about that at our last meeting, but didn't fully resolve it. After we resolve that, um, what I'd like to do is go through the different sections of the staff report and see if DRB members have any questions um, and then take paying particular attention to the two items that Meredith mentioned, walkways, connectivity to the public sidewalk, as well as the, um, the fence issue. All right, so with that, um, let's get started. So um, on page, let's look at my notes here. Um, page five of our staff reports for this provides an overview of, um, it sort of, it raises the question, is this, a sewer related facility, which is a type of utility facility that would merit addition, the application of additional standards. Um, and I, I did this last time, but I just want to be very clear since I think as a board, we hadn't made up our collective minds. Um, I'm just going to read from page five. A sewer related facility is within the class of utilities uses. 
The definition of sewer-related facility is facilities for storing, pumping, and treating sewage. I believe and is an operative word there. Um, unless located on municipal land, sewer-related facilities are conditional uses. A utility facility is defined as electric lines and distribution facilities, phone lines, cable lines, gas lines and distribution facilities, water supply lines, steam and air conditioning lines, and sewer and stormwater lines, and also includes substations, pump stations, and other related unmanned systems. The definition, the overarching definition of utility facility gives a sense of the type of thing that we're, we're looking at here. So um, we, we heard a little bit of, of testimony from the applicant um, last week on this, and there are just a couple things I, I wanna, our tes the testimony we heard last time is that sewage is pumped from portalettes being cleaned into storage tanks on trucks, and then those trucks are driven away to either Montpelier's wastewater treatment facility or another contracted facility. Do I have that right? Yes, and I want to specify that the portalettes are cleaned at the site where they have gotten use, not necessarily at the site of 260 River Street. So wherever they are, they're brought somewhere, they're used there, they're pumped there, the pumped truck goes to the municipal facility, and the clean portalettes get brought back to the, facility, the 260 River Street location. That's a very helpful clarification. So there isn't really even movement of sewage between two receptacles on the 260 River Street site. Thank you, oh, that's a good clarification. Um, well, yeah, okay, never mind. well, I was just gonna say, when you clean the trucks, right, you, you pump it from one truck to another, and then you take that second truck and you dump that, is that, is that how you guys clean the, the truck? Tr each, each truck um, goes to, directly to the municipal facility. Is that what Are you asking about if they clean the inside of the truck? Yeah, I guess. Yeah, the the um, insides of the trucks are are rarely cleaned. Um, they're because there's so much usage. Um, the nothing really settles. Uh, nothing really gets stuck to the sides because there's always in and out. It's so frequent. Um, if there were to be any type of um, interior to the tank maintenance required, that would be the the only time that. Um, there'd be any cleaning of the inside of the tank and, and really it's, it's essentially um, clean. They don't, they don't do regular cleaning to the insides of the tanks. Everything is emptied off site to the municipal facilities. So there shouldn't be um, like filling up one tank just so you don't have to take the other one to the wastewater treatment plant. Okay. Okay. Roger. Um, just to follow up when they do, uh, um, on those rare occasions, clean the inside of the tank. Um, where is that drained to? I think that it was indicated that it would have um, it would be it would be vacuumed out with another truck. So it's not, it doesn't it doesn't drain into a water drain or anything like that. Um, only the outside of vehicles are cleaned to a floor drain. So it is a, it's a contained process, but on an incredibly rare occasion. Thank you. Okay, so, so your testimony is that pump, pumping from truck to truck is very, very unlikely to happen. Cleaning out of tanks would not drain onto the site, but rather would drain into another truck. Okay, okay, so then, um, thank you. Um, do other board members have questions about the definition? We're trying to determine if this is a facility for storing, pumping, and treating sewage. Gene? So there is storage of sewage in the facility and in the trucks that might come in and not actually go in. The, the sewage will stay in the trucks, from what I understand, if they're at the site. 
the the only time the sewage is stored in a truck on the site is when a truck has gone on an emergency call or an after hours after the municipal plant has already shut down for the day. So if the municipal municipal plant is not accepting any waste, the truck would have to go to the site containing sewage until the, the municipality opened back up. And would you say in your testimony that would would there be a rare some rare occasions where uh, porta parties were picked up from a one uh, location and brought you know unclean to the facility is that a, p a possibility where they had to pick them up and get it off site and they didn't have to they didn't have time necessarily time to clean them at another facility and bring them back um, and then have to do it on the site. How do you assure that? Every, um, everything that I have been told about the way the company operates is that that does not happen, that the portal lifts need to be cleaned prior to, to movement. Um, and that's, that's, I'm relying on what the company said. They're an environmental company. They're um, very conscientious of the environment. So I, would believe what they have said. I mean, somebody would notice and call them out on it if they if they weren't operating how they should be. So I, I um, am willing to believe what they have said is is what they do. Okay, thank you, Alicia. So I'm going to go back to that definition. Um, storing is not a typical practice. It may happen occasionally if a wastewater treatment facility is closed when the truck arrives. Pumping is also not a standard part of the operation of this area. And there is nothing we that we have heard no testimony that any treatment of sewage happens on this site. Is that correct, Alicia? Does treatment of sewage happen on this site? It is not. Okay. So because there's an and there, which suggests all three of those things need to happen for it to be a sewer related facility, I'm willing to go with staff recommendation that this is not a sewage sewer related facility. Um, how do other board members feel about that? I agree with that. Yes. Raising hand is agree. Yeah. Okay. Great. Okay. All right. Jean, you're on the fence. One more question. Uh, I'm not, okay. Uh, I mean, uh, it's just this. This is a, in my opinion, I mean, this is just a, a highly potential site for. It's a beautiful site with river access and, and views and and just the, for an industrial facility to establish their business there with with a business that that pertains to sewage and renting portlets and going back and forth with the sewage trucks. Um, if any of any time where these vehicles or portlets, as you say, in a rare occasion, um, is clean there, then that sewage, in a, in in a way, with the chemicals used, is is being treated. So the the, the three things that defined what a sewage, I mean. Uh, facility is I, I feel that it, it could potentially happen in this facility um, so I'm not 100% on board okay well thanks thanks for thanks for explaining your reasoning and um, thinking through it um, I feel that based on the time we've spent on this and the testimony we've received and the the leanings of the majority of board members, I, we're going to proceed the, the, with this, deter, with the determination that this is not a sewage, um, keep forgetting the word, sewer related facility. Um, and that therefore will not be subject to conditional use review. Okay. All right. So let's move on then. Um, we moved through a number of the standards in our in our previous meeting, but I, we did that sort of we did it later, and uh, people may have had a chance to think about things then since then. So I want to give DRB members an option to ask any additional questions 
to solicit evidence that would allow them to make a decision about this. So at our last meeting, we covered the general standards, and these included dimensional standards, riparian areas, wetlands and vernal pools, steep slopes, erosion control, stormwater, access and circulation, and parking and loading. Do board members have any lingering um, questions about those elements? And I'm sorry, I don't have the page numbers handy for you, but it's the standards that start on page six of the staff report. Oh, okay. I'm seeing shaking heads uh, from 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 Roger and Joe and Rob and Jean. You're all right. All right. Okay. Great. So then the next batch of standards we looked at were special use standards for various uses taking place on the site. These included fences and walls, temporary construction and related uses, and automobile repair and service. Um, we have, a, uh, at Meredith's recommendation, I think we should talk a little bit more about fences. Um, so let's do that. So, yeah, Roger. Uh, Madam Chair, what um, page are we on? Sorry, so fences began on, the special use standards began on page 15 of the staff report. And that's um, 15 of the staff report itself, not the big packet. Okay. Um, so in order to under, what we have being proposed, um, so our requirements generally limit front yard fences to four and a half feet, and then side and rear yard fences generally to six feet. Um, those fences used for screening seem to have some more flexibility um, in our regulations. And um, Alicia, maybe you could describe very briefly for us what, what the um, configuration of the fences are. And if you'd like to share your screen or refer us to any diagrams, that, that would be fine. Certainly. Not to put you on the spot. Let me, let me pull this up. I always forget the share. Okay. Um, can folks see the site plan? Maybe we could have yes, you zoom great. in a bit. Okay. Um, just just okay. to, to re relate, here's River Street, Route 2, and then the backside is the Winooski River. Um, okay. Taking, a, taking its time right now. So there's a couple okay. different sections of thing. Um, and so we want to be clear about what everything is. There is a split rail fence along the top of the bank, um, which is not what we're kind of discussing right now, but there is another fence back there. Um, so the, the privacy, the idea is that we were having a um, screening fence. So it wasn't intended to be kind of an architectural oddity, but it um, more so that it's intended to screen. And so when we did that, we have, um, the outdoor storage areas over here on the northern end of the site, and then over here on the southern end, both of those um, are outdoor storage areas. So we wanted to make sure that we were screening those well from view, um, intentionally from route two. Um, so there's the fencing over here is proposed to be uh, the six foot tall wooden privacy fence, as well as all of these fences are proposed to be that same fence. I think it was just a thought to have the, the site be more cohesive to have all one height instead of kind of having ups and downs throughout the site. Also, um, it's not really, it's not a traditional front yard. Um, the, the front of this site as it faces River Street actually abuts the railroad. Um, so there's, there's a significant different distance between the actual River Street um, and where the, the fencing is being held. Um, it, it is on the front side of the property, but not, not a, a true front yard, um, as we have about 50 feet of um, road frontage where it's a right-of-way across the railroad. So it's a very non-traditional site. 
Um, so that's why we, we have it proposed to be six foot for those reasons, to have a more cohesive site um, to, and to, to do a better job of screening. Um, they're going to be having their um, in portalets and then potentially other any type of equipment uh, could be back here. And so that higher um, fence would really help block and buffer and screen from any vantage point there. Um, that's the idea with having the taller, especially with the buffer of the railroad, um, there's no sight lines that are being compromised as, as this stands. Okay, great. Thank you for recapping that. I know you did a lot of that at our last meeting, but um, three weeks on is helpful for the refresher and the orientation to the site. Thank you very much. Um, all right, so I think I think what the DR, what's um, up to the DRB, before the DRB is the decision to regard that small stretch of fence, um, the six foot fence over toward the left of the drawing, um, whether we consider that screening and thus not um, bound by the four and a half foot limit for front yard fences. Um, I believe that's what's before us. Um, Roger. Yeah, yes. Um based on Alicia's um, explanation, I think it's uh, clearly screening. Well, I, I look at this, yes, absolutely. I think it's okay. Um, but the specific thing is, is because it's next to the railroad right away. Um, I think actually what we might find us as the situation is, is that the railroad to build, were to build a fence inside the railroad right away, the city would actually, <laughs> local zoning regulations would have no jurisdiction over it at all. Um, so uh, when it comes to whether it's screening or not screening or front yard or not, um, uh, that gets pretty specific when we start comparing, uh, uh, you know, these determinations around um, if someone wants to build a fence, but specifically because of the railroad, um, I, I really don't think that this uh, height limitation uh, applies and I'm okay with it moving forward. Um, I'm of a mind, uh, I, I would take the screening justification as the um, reason for accepting it from the front, the height limitation on the front, though, Rob, what you describe about a railroad being able to do whatever the heck it, heck it wants would kind of render our goal um, in our zoning bylaw kind of useless. Um, but as far as what we have to hang our hat on, as, as I think it is a screening sense. Um, Jean or Joe, anything to add or ask about that? Oh, no, I'm happy to move forward. The, does the fence okay. go completely, I couldn't see it on the full page, from the from the beginning, the entryway of access, so the, from the stretch of the site all the way to the end of the building and beyond? The, um, the fence is proposed to start. Can you see my cursor moving or yeah. not? Yes, yeah. thank okay. you. So this is where the, the section of fencing is proposed to start at that's that's being kind of uh, talked about right now from here technically to the front building the building line um so it's the, this corner that's um being asked to be six foot instead of the max four and a half would this be a chain link type of fence or a, a, a wooden structure no. what Wooden privacy fence. Yeah, so it's intended to be, um, uh, you, you're not supposed to see through it, so you don't have to see the storage, um, right. the items that are being stored behind it. Yeah. Oh, okay, thank you, Alicia. Okay. Great, okay, I think we've heard some good testimony on that, and I would, I would like to suggest that we um, move on. Thank you all. Um, all right, so fences and walls. Are there any other questions about any of the special use standards that are reviewed in the staff report, temporary construction, related uses, uses, automobile repair services? Okay, let's move on. The next batch of standards is the site plan standards, bike pad access and circulation, landscaping and screening, outdoor lighting, outdoor seating, design and compatibility. Um, we heard a lot of testimony last week on landscaping and screening. Um, for outdoor lighting, we heard um, we heard about we heard about that. Um, so I, I just want to make sure we have what we need pertaining to bike pet, bicycle and pedestrian bicyclist and pedestrian access and circulation. Um, 
do folks have any, I want to recap what I think we heard at the, in the testimony. Sorry, I'm looking at my notes here. Um, so we've received testimony that there is no need or desire for public access to the site given the uses. Um, and that it wouldn't be appropriate to have a crosswalk or access over the railroad crossing. Um, but one thing I would like to know um, from Alicia is in the event that somebody, some, an employee say, arrives to the site on a bike, um, particularly with the Cross Vermont Trail nearby, it's not out of the realm of possibility. Um, how do you think they would access the site safely? I, I think that they are familiar with the um, site in general and the driveway is designed to be 24 feet. Um, oops, I can share my screen again just to show it. Um, so I have shown the driveway wide in this portion where there might be truck traffic um, more likely to occur. And then the trucks would maneuver into the main area that they would be. And then the driveway narrows um, for uh, vehicle um, used by employee parking. And so the idea is that there is extra space in this area should they want to use it. Um, we feel like the employees are very aware of the timing and the, the equipment being used and the trucks being on the site. Um, and so they would be able to utilize the, extra, the widened driveway to, to get to that front of the building um, without necessarily having to have a designated pedestrian walkway that kind of invites more than just employees to use it. Okay. Thanks. So your, your testimony is what I'm hearing you say is that the driveway is um, functionally adequate for limited bike head access by employees and not the public. Correct. Okay, great. Um, do board members have questions about this or anything else in the site plan standard section? Okay, I feel like we've covered that pretty well. Um, all right, so I'm just flipping through the staff report. I believe that we have covered most of what needs to be covered, including the items that Meredith highlighted for us. Um, the st portions of the staff report regarding the conditional use standards are not applicable because we determined that this is not a conditional use. All right, um, yeah, Alicia. I just wanted to, um, there was a small change in the doors of the um, overhead doors. So I, I wanted to, I don't know how um, involved the physical configuration of the overhead doors are. This, this door got moved, slid down the building um, to avoid a water, existing water location and sprinkler room. So I just, I can send this plan to Meredith um, for inclusion in the kind of record set, um, but I wanted to make sure if there were any questions about door location um, that that has been shifted. This um, these doors here kind of shifted a couple feet in one way or the other, so I just wanted to make sure that was noted. Thanks. Yep, sending along those drawings for the final record would be would be great. And um, questions from board members about door location. Okay, two processes served. Thank you for making sure we have the most up-to-date information. Um, other questions from board members about this application? All right, in that case, let's exit the um, screen share if you wouldn't mind. Thanks, Alicia. Um, I would entertain a motion. Okay, uh, I make a motion to approve the 7,823 foot square uh, square foot uh, footprint two-story addition change of use and major site plan changes as presented in application Z2020-0027 and supporting and supplemental materials submitted to the following conditions of approval within 30 days of issuance of this written decision and prior to issuance of a zoning permit applicant shall provide the zoning administrator with a final grading plan Signed by um, a professional, I'll finish and then can add Meredith. Yeah. 
Go okay. ahead, Rob. Engineer licensed uh, in the state of Vermont applicant shall provide the following uh, to the zoning administrator for permit file, copies of all applicable state of Vermont construction general permits, and copies of all applicable state of Vermont stormwater permits. Applicant shall comply, comply with all requirements of uh, section 3113. Uh, and I specifically note that we are approving uh, a six foot tall fence fence uh, along the railroad right away as uh, presented in the supporting materials. Very good. Um, we have a motion. Is there a sec? Um, in order to ensure that the motion is comprehensive, I will accept comments from staff. <laughs> Meredith. Thank you. Uh, just sort of a friendly, maybe somebody can make a motion for a friendly amendment. We actually already have the um, signed and sealed grading plan and other documents that we needed because Alicia provided those at the June 15th hearing. So if somebody can make that okay. amendment. Well, let's get a second and then someone can make a friendly amendment to the, to the motion that's made and seconded. Thank you, Meredith, that's a good update. So thank you, Rob, we have a motion. Is there a second? I'll second. Motion from Rob, second from Roger. Is there any discussion or friendly amendments? I, I would be willing to make that friendly amendment that notes. Um, the material, the grading plan has already been received, so the re receipt of that does not need to be a condition of the motion. Is that acceptable? That is acceptable. Thank you, Rob. And Roger? Yes, acceptable. Great, thanks. Is there any further discussion of the motion? All right, hearing none, we will take a roll. I will say your name. Please vote yay or nay. Roger? Yes. Dean? Yes. Rob? Yes. Joe? Yes. And I also vote yes. Thank you very much for your participation. Thanks for coming back for another round to make sure that we had plenty of time. We weren't rushing this. I appreciate that, Alicia. And extend our thanks to, to the applicant as well. Um, Meredith, is there anything you'd like to add to wrap this one up? Nope, I, I think we're good. We'll be, um, so we have technically the board has uh, 45 days to issue the written decision, Alicia, but we try to do it much sooner than that. Um, and in this instance, because you've already met the pre-permit um, conditions to provide me with those plans, um, the chances are, you know, as long as I have that, you'll send me that final, that new document probably to tonight or tomorrow, then the permit should get issued along with the written decision. You can get it all in one packet. Um, and so following receipt of that permit, there's a 30 day appeal period. So just so that you're aware. Thank you. Thanks everybody. Hey, thank you. All right. Thank you all. Um, so moving on to the next item on our agenda, item seven is uh, 100 East State Street. It's an application for uh, renovation of a 580 square foot garage. Um, and we're looking at uh, demolition, considering demolition of an attached shed and the construction of an accessory structure. So I may have stolen the, um, Stolen Meredith's overview there, but what I would like to do is turn it to Meredith for an overview and then I'll swear in any witnesses. Okay. Um, so, uh, as Kate said, this is an application um, to renovate a garage into a, a dwelling unit. There's actually some accessory structures associated with that. Um, and because the parcel also has commercial property on it, um, the site plan provisions apply, but it's a minor site plan because the um, change in impervious surface and other requirements are small enough that it's minor site plan. Um, the major reason that this came to the Development Review Board is because um, applicant is proposing to demolish a shed that is a attached to the rear of the garage and the garage is listed as a contributing structure on the National Register of Historic Places. Um, and it, it was enough of a, there wasn't, there wasn't a nice bright line there because they're attached 
for me to just make the determination on my own that it didn't have to go to the DRB. Um, the, the new kind of wrinkle that came up as I was finishing my review on this last week, um, and that would have also sent this to the DRB, um, is that this application triggers the public sidewalk requirements of section 3202B of the zoning regulations. There's some information on that in your staff report. So that would be, um, sorry, hold on one second, uh, page 124 of your packet for tonight's meeting. Um, and it is um, page 10 of the staff report. So the thing here is that under section 3202B, a sidewalk shall be provided along the street frontage of a subject property if a sidewalk currently terminates at a property abutting the subject property. So at, at 100 East State Street. Um, and that requirement can only be waived or the specific construction requirements that are also in 302. 3202B can only be waived or modified if the director of public works supports a waiver and the DRB has to be the one to grant that waiver. Um, this is the very first time that this particular provision has been triggered since these regulations were adopted. In this instance, a stretch of public sidewalk ends right at the property line um, as it's going up East State Street. So there is this, this requirement for a public sidewalk is triggered. Um, I've, I've, I'm not, I haven't sent you a whole bunch of additional information because an official comments from the Department of Public Works because they are still tr trying to figure out how best to resolve this. Um, the city has plans to, or is planning to tear up East State Street. Um, it's part of, hold on one second. Um, would it help if I did a screen share? Maybe? Um, Maybe, yeah. Okay, so hold on. So there's this document. So I'm gonna go up to the top so that people from home can see. Would um, you zoom in for us a little bit, please, Meredith? Yep, let me get up to the top first and then, okay. oh, and of course I'm on, here we go. Um, so it's called the City of Montpelier, Montpelier in Motion. It was a study in 2015. Um, and on page 24 of this study, you start to see this discussions about all sorts of stretches of sidewalk and specify specific ones that, um, that where there needs to be efforts to fix gaps in the sidewalk around the city. The stretch we're talking about um, is noted here. It's the north side of East State Street. It says just State Street, but it means East State Street. Betsy's B&B &B is actually 74 East State Street. Um, and so they're talking about that all the way up to West Street. So um, if I go, can you see the different screen now? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, so here's 120 Street. This is 74 East State Street here. And West Street is here. So okay. right now the sidewalk ends right here. And there's a crosswalk right. across East State Street, right? Then there's yeah. roughly 400 feet of frontage till you get to Bingham Street. There's right now there's no sidewalk on Bingham, so there's no requirement that Bingham Street have have sidewalk added. Um, but that is a lot of sidewalk. Uh, question. Okay, let's let's consider that a good overview for starters, and maybe get into more detail with some of our options um, as as we get to that item in the staff report. But that's Perfect. useful to flag that. Um, flag that that's where we may be spending some time. Okay, and just, can I just throw in one other okay. brief wrinkle? Um, yes. Okay, sorry. So 
we're also, in addition to details from DPW, I'm also waiting for um, clarification from city's attorneys because trying to mandate that a private property owner do something with their property can flag takings complications. Okay. Let's, let's get into that later. Perfect. Let's get into that later. I, I don't want to prejudice anything, though. Um, I, I think um, that, is, that is good to know that we're, that we're facing that. I think um, let's hear from the applicants and um, go through some of the highlights in the in the in the staff report and then we can when we get to that section we'll talk a little bit about um, what information we still need in order to for the drb to make a determination so thank you meredith i didn't mean to cut you off but um we'll keep it high level for now and we'll get back into it in a sec could, could, I, make a, could I make a comment on the sidewalk so sure. let me let I, I, not yet, please. Um, I, I want to okay. make sure I swear you in so that the testimony that you give is um, in the record in a in a very official way. So I think, um, I think I Ward is going to testify before the case. I just wanted to note something specific about public okay, access that to up. property. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Hold that thought, please. So um, I would like. I believe I'm swearing in Yana and Ward. Is there anyone else here to be heard on this matter? All right, um, I will issue the oath. Um, do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you are about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth under pains and penalties of perjury? I do. I do. Yep, I do. Okay, thank you both. So Yana, if you, if you wanna make your comment now, that would be fine with me. I, I'm, I'm turning, I would like to turn it over to, to you and Ward as the applicants to um, give maybe a, a 10 minute or so overview of the project. So just a quick thought on the sidewalk that it does cross over to the other side so that the public, you know, can cross over the street and continue walking down East State Street. And right where the crosswalk crosses from our property to the other side of the street, there's a set of old stairs that comes up to the main house. I think uh, kids in the 50s used to use it as a shortcut to the school or something. I've heard that. Um, so, so public trying to reach you know, someone at this property could just walk up the stairs and be at the front door, basically. Okay, thanks. I've always found that to be an intriguing little path. So thanks for telling us it, it does indeed exist. Um, great. So, um, Ward, maybe next I'll turn it over to you if you're ready to, to give us an uh, overview of the project. I am, thank you. So it, it might be easier to answer specific questions because uh, the project is pretty straightforward. It's taking an existing garage and renovating it into a, a kind of a single bedroom unit. The waiver, I believe, that we're requesting or the, I'm not sure the proper term, is simply to take down a, I think it's a six by ten um, storage Space on the back of the building that's built as a pole barn. So it's got like four vertical studs on the wall and then just horizontal siding between and it's rotted. So it's a very ancillary addition to the back of a building that we just want to remove because it doesn't have any function in the renovation and because it's substandard and it would be too hard to renovate. So essentially we're building a small unit within um, an existing building and um, we're adding a deck and a shed that is covered on the deck so that the tiny house has storage and we envision that ventilated shed to be capable of having the dumpster and recycling in it as well as bike storage and it's also um, a little extra space for the tenants and it's on the far side of the building from the historic building. So the garage itself is being rebuilt, is being renovated very much to look like it always has. And then the shed and the covered shed is a little more contemporary, but it's, it's next to the historic building. And so it's, it's change of character is in line with the historic preservation standards that new should not um, appear to look old. So we have a little more contemporary look on the piece to the right. Um, Can I make yeah, a comment about the shed? Yeah, please. 
Yeah. Um, so it, it, this is, um, you're looking at the picture in the center of the screen in color, and this is how it looks from the driveway. So uh, the, sh the shed kind of uh, creates the separation um, from the public parking area, which is just great. They'll have their privacy in the back uh, of the unit. Right, and then the um, uh, Meredith brought up the condition that there's really supposed to be screening between two buildings of different use. And what um, we've done on this building is the two windows that face the commercial building is one of three windows in the bedroom and one of two bedrooms, one of two windows in the bathroom. And we envision those having um, shades and there's other windows in both of those spaces. And the orientation of the spaces in the building all look away from the commercial building including the deck, as Jana just pointed out, which is completely screened and private from the commercial building because the challenge with this garage is it's about five feet off the site. It's got a very high foundation wall, so screening is really, you know, you'd almost have to put a mature tree in to screen between the old garage and the house. So we've just really um, oriented the building away from the commercial building so that it has all of its light seeking and views and public or you know outdoor space away from the commercial building and you know it's pretty straightforward other than that i'd be happy to respond to some of the the concerns or i should say the staff you know the staff recommendations or concerns but um i think there's nothing else really um that I think I need to comment on at this point, unless you'd like me to. Hello. You're muted. I was muted. Sorry, gang. Um, how's that? I have a question um, in general. Yeah, Joe. Uh, has this project come because of their design review committee? Or is it? Uh, I'm sorry. If that was a question, I missed it. I somehow lost my audio for a moment. I'll, I'll repeat it. I think Joe's yeah. connection was a little unstable there. Has, okay. has, has this already gone through the design review committee? was Joe's question, right, Joe? Yeah. I think Meredith would tell you it doesn't need to because it's um, it's an allowed use. Is that not correct, Meredith? Uh, it, or it, 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 so it doesn't need to go through the design review committee because it is um, just exempt from that review. It's not in the design review overlay district. Okay. Um, and then okay. the the you know, design review, not design review, sorry. Um, if you look at uh, the page 14 of your staff report for if it was a major site plan application where there was there was a you know 2000 foot addition or addition of 2000 square feet of impervious surface or other specifics, um, specific criteria, then it would have to be reviewed under 3207 design and compatibility but this is a minor site plan so that those questions don't come up. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Meredith. That was a good question, Joe. It's good to know where kind of the lines are, the different thresholds, whether it's the district or site plan, major versus minor site plan. It's a good reminder of where we are. So when I was muted, I made a very long, elegant speech about um, proposing, asking DRB members if you'd be okay if we go through the staff report and kind of move through those things that do not require a lot of discussion, but um, provide opportunity for, um, just use that as a framework for our discussion and questioning. Does that work for DRB members? Yes. Yeah, great. Okay, so with that, we'll turn to the staff report. Um, great overview, great to see the pictures as always. Um, so jumping right in to the general standards on page three, um, we know that from the staff report that the use is a, is an um, 
complies with the use standards. This is an additional single dwelling unit. It's not an accessory dwelling unit because the other use isn't a single family home. It's a commercial use with a house nearby. Um, this meets the dimensional standards because it is a very large lot in an area that requires small lots. Um, as far as accessory dwellings and uses, um, it meets those standards. Um, so are there any questions about those three things before we get into the demolition piece? So just basic and seem pretty straightforward. All right, okay. Um, so demolition is where we need to do a little bit of evaluation. So we, we have heard testimony that um, a small pole barn style shed off the back is proposed to be demolished um, off of the structure, that it is rotted. We've seen pictures in our staff report um, that show the condition of that of that structure. So our job as the DRB is to, um, well, first I think we need to, deter and Meredith, correct me if I'm wrong, but first we need to determine whether this is part of the contributing structure. We know that the shed, the garage itself built around 1956 or something um, is listed on the, on, in the National Register, but this little shed off the back is not listed. Um, Ward or Yana, do you do you know when that when that shed that you're proposing to demolish was added to the structure? I do not. Know. No, we don't know. It's definitely built later, as it wasn't built to later. Yeah, I mean, I would guess it's thirty years old from its construction type, twenty or thirty years old. I think it was you know there for a lawnmower and a and stuff. I mean, it's pretty, pretty lightweight, um, later construction. Okay. Um, okay, great. Um, so Meredith, am I correct that one of the things we could determine is that there is enough evidence that it, to determine that it, it is itself the part that we're proposing that is proposed to be demolished is itself not historic. Is that something that we could determine if we have enough evidence, Meredith? Right. That that it is separate enough and distinct enough from the historically listed garage um, that combined with with that determ that determination combined with the fact that it is not mentioned in the um, National Register listing of the garage that those things all combined mean that the extra scrutiny for historic structures doesn't apply to the shed. So yes. Okay, thank you. Um, board members, do you feel you have enough evidence to make that determination? If not, we can take the path of going through the criteria for how one does approve or evaluate the demolition of a historic structure. So what's the, what's the pleasure of the board? Uh, Joe Karen Ham. I'm satisfied with what we've uh, heard so far. Okay, thanks. Me too. Okay. So I'm getting that board members are generally satisfied with evidence presented that this shed off the back that's proposed to be demolished is not a part of the historic structure. Okay. I, I agree with that. Um, what that means is that we do not then need to go through the criteria of 30, 3004 demolition. Um, and that answers that question. Um, Meredith, are there other considerations that we should be making? Uh, sorry, other considerations for 3004 or other matters at oh, all? For 3004. Yeah. For 3004. No, okay. it, I mean, it's, it just means, you know, he, they need approval of the demolition as part of the permit. So it'll still, whenever somebody makes the motion, if we get there, it will still need a motion for approval of the shed, but it's nothing, nothing else needs to be determined. Okay, I'm satisfied with that as well. Thank you. In that case, we're going to move on through the staff report. Um, Um, that brings us to page seven, um, some of the other general standards, riparian areas, wetlands and vernal pools 
are said not are um, not applicable here because those resources are not present on the site per staff investigation. Um, and then steep steep slopes. Um, we there is no disturbance of slopes over thirty percent, and the. The dis disturbance, sorry, I, I did read this earlier. I'm, I'm refreshing my memory as we go. Um, steeper than 25%, it looks like the disturbance we're seeing there is, is basically a de minimis disturbance. Um, Ward or Yana, would you be willing to, to describe how, what will be taking place on the steeper slopes on the site? Um, yeah, we're just adding, um, uh, is it two or three sauna tubes to support the deck? So the lightweight deck and three sauna tubes being put into a slope, which um, I don't believe is, we have a LIDAR uh, site plan which showed us where the triggered slopes are, and I, I don't believe we're on them, but we're, um, but I mean, it is, it is close to a 15% slope, but it's, I believe, Meredith's determination that the level of impact doesn't doesn't constitute a concern or doesn't trigger um, doesn't trigger the threshold for um, for a problem on that. Okay. Thank you, um, DRB members. Any questions about um, impacts to? Steep slopes. Uh, the staff recommendation is that 3007 doesn't apply because it's such a small impact. To, if you feel differently or want to know more, please ask questions. All right. I think we've we know what we need to know about steep slopes on this site. Um, moving on in the general standards, erosion control. Um, this is a, a small project, so it doesn't trigger the preparation of a professionally, a professional erosion control plan. There is a recommendation that we, we, as the board, include a condition requiring the applicant to follow erosion control practices um, outlined in our zoning. Um, would the applicants be amenable to a condition of that sort? Yes, absolutely. Great, thanks. Um, questions from board members? Um, board member, thank you. Do feel free to chime in. I don't mean to rush. I want to be um, efficient, but I don't want to shut down conversations. So if there is something, please don't be shy. Um, okay, moving on. Um, stormwater management. Um, no stormwater management plan is required. There's very little increase in the area of impermeable surface, um, according to staff review. Um, that makes sense to the ERB members. Anything to add there? Okay. Um, similarly, access and circulation are not significantly changed, it seems, in terms of the volume or the or the layout within the site. Same with, um, I think, is what we're seeing with parking and loading areas. And then there are no signs proposed, so that's not applicable. I'm on page 10 of the staff report now. Um, is there anything that DRB members want to ask about access, parking and loading, signs? Anything that, okay. Anything important that the applicants want us to know? No, I mean, it's directly adjacent to the garage is a huge parking lot for the building with like 20 parking spaces. So, you know, there's very, very ample parking and there's no, um, no need for specified parking specifically for this unit because there's a huge parking lot next to it. Great. All right. Thank you. Okay. So that's a review of the general standards. We're going to move on to the site plan standards. And as Meredith explained well earlier, um, this is a minor site plan review. So certain things apply, certain things don't. Um, bike, bicycle and pedestrian, bike and pedestrian access and circulation. Um, so we're going to talk about sidewalks. 
before we do, um, I had one question. Um, I think Ward, did you testify that um, there will be bicycle storage for the for the unit? In the yeah, there's a there's an ample deck to the right of the building that is plenty big enough to park and lock a bike. Yes. Okay. That answers, that does it for me. Um, all right. So what we'll discuss next is um, what Meredith gave us a preview of at the beginning. Um, maybe what I'll do first is uh, invite Yana and Ward to, if, if there's anything you'd like to add about the sidewalk, Yana provide testimony that there is a private path from the public sidewalk up to the site. Um, is there anything else that, that you would like to add about the zoning bylaws well, can, I ask a, can I ask a question, please? Meredith and I had a conversation today about the issue of the sidewalk running up East State across the 400 foot length of the property, which Meredith says is in the city's priorities. So that's a kind of that's probably going to happen. But are, you're not suggesting that a sidewalk is expected to be developed alongside the driveway into the lot, are you? I'm not. No. Okay. So there's no. I, I mean, I think Meredith can can express this more eloquently than I. But the sidewalk along East State is a is a something the city wants to develop, and I don't think the city would expect the property owner to do it, but to partner and to allow the city to do it in the near future as part of their their long term goals. And I, Yana can answer this question because. I, I briefed her that this was going to be talked about tonight, but I don't think the owners have a problem with having a sidewalk developed by, at the city's cost in the future. Okay. okay. Um, is that your understanding as well, Yana? Uh, yeah, that is my understanding. Okay. The pretty, um, pretty steep slopes there, though. <laughs> mm-hmm. Like mm -hmm. very, hard, very hard to maintain. Like we are not even able yeah. to mow it. It's very steep. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And it is it is an engineered slope. There was according to Tim Heaney was rebuilt something like in the seventies. They had to they had to bring in granite blocks and right under the grass is a huge kind of constructed slope. But uh, that that shouldn't impact. Does the, does it go right to the curb? I can't even remember the exact condition. It might be actually very difficult to build a sidewalk there, but. Hmm. Um, okay. If the city has the will, I'm sure they can figure it out, and the property owner is not going to stand in the way of that. Okay. Um, okay, so at this point, I'd like to ask for clarification from Meredith. Meredith, is it true that the applicant is not expected to build the sidewalk at their own expense? Um. So this is one of the problems with the language in this regulation, right? So this is a question mark in our zoning? This is, right. But I mean, okay. the, my understanding, I, I haven't been able to track down um, the any city survey of this, um, although I've been told that there may be one. I, I've been, I spent a lot of my day on this today. Um, we believe that the sidewalk itself would probably be in what is public right of way. So that's public right of way. That's not something where the city would be asking the 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 owners to, to build something there. I wouldn't think, because that just doesn't make logical sense. The big issue is that it's not clear because they haven't done all the engineering studies as to where they would need to put a retaining wall, where exactly that would lie if that was in public right of way or on private property. And mm -hmm. even if it's on public right of way, there would likely need to be some sort of access agreement um, and easement to be able to do the construction. There would need to be digging up of the, the 100 East State Street property um, along mm -hmm. the edge. Exactly, you know, the, the city, this has not been a priority for the city is my understanding. So they mm -hmm. haven't, you know, and especially with all the current budget issues, there have not been studies to determine exactly how this would work. Um, so 
that's, okay. that's what I've got for that. We'll deal with any other issues as okay. you need. Okay, thank you. Um, that helps us know some of our unknowns. So um, uh, as a board, we, we uh, it's my opinion, and I'd like to know what others think. Um, we are lacking input from city count, council, C-O-U-N-S-E-L, um, attorneys, as to whether this, whether this aspect of our zoning can operate constitutionally, whether it, whether it constitutes a taking as it's written. I would be uncomfortable making any decisions about that without getting advice from, from attorneys. At the same time, we have not yet received official comments from the Department of Public Works about um, their plans for this, any preliminary thoughts, or anything that would allow us to make a decision about what's even possible here. Um, so, the other thing that is, um, a, I'm thinking out loud a little, so forgive me, but a, another thing that is a possible path here is that the applicant could request a waiver from this, and I don't know if that has happened or not. Um, ha Meredith, has a waiver been officially requested? A, a, a waiver hasn't been officially requested. It can, I think we've done this before where the applicant makes that request during the public hearing. Um, you know, to get that waiver, you need to get, according to these regulations, we have to have sort of sign off from the director of public works is my reading of this. Okay. Um, but they okay. can request that waiver for sure. Mm -hmm. Okay. Is that something you've con um, you've contemplated, Ward and Yana? No, but it sounds like the simplest path. I mean, the sidewalk out front is such a colossal job that I think it would be appropriate for us to request a waiver. And if given, um, that would help us. And then, as I said, the if the city wants to build a sidewalk in the future, the, the landowner is not going to produce an impediment. And so I think the smoothest way forward is to say it's not really on the table right now that huge sidewalk for the renovation of a garage. Okay. So I would like to request a waiver on behalf of the owners, yes. Okay, noted, thank you. So with that waiver request, um, in order to for the DRB to evaluate and grant it, we are required to basically get concurrence from the Department of Public Works, which we don't yet have. Um, so I believe that what that means is that we would, we can still complete our review of this application, but this one outstanding issue, because of this one outstanding issue, we may need to continue to our next meeting um, in the hopes that DPW's input would be forthcoming. Is, is that a um, path that you would recommend, or is that, is that a possible path, Meredith, that would allow us to address this in your view? I think so, yeah. Um, you know, I am expecting input from city attorneys um, as well as more input from the Department of Public Works um, this week, early next week at the latest. Um, it might it might involve Ward and Yana, some discussions between you and Department of Public Works as well um, to, to figure out, you know, exactly where where the right public right of way ends, things along those lines. Um, but I, I think that's doable. There's also, I mean, it doesn't have to, I know Ward and I talked earlier um, that it wouldn't necessarily have to be to the immediate next meeting as long as it's continued to a date certain. So you, right, and, right, Kate, right. you and Ward can discuss that. But yes, I think that's, that's definitely a way to handle this situation. So I have a clarifying question. So are we trying to provide a way for the public to move up and down East State Street or access our property specifically? What is up and down East State? The, right. the, what the zoning calls for is um, for when a big development, pro when a development project happens on an individual parcel to fill in the blanks on, on the sidewalk as part of that. And I think that the, the policy, I, I would guess, and this is a big assumption, um, but I would guess that the policy motivation for that is to allow people to access a site that has become more developed safely once it's become developed more intensively. 
You know what I mean? So like if you're going to build something where there wasn't something before, you want a sidewalk so people can get there. So I think that's kind of the underlying policy goal. And when I wanted to say that the sidewalk does exist on East State Street and we do have a you know path and a set of stairs and we can provide a guardrail for people to be you know to access the front door if they're walking from downtown. So okay. I feel like you know we kind of meet both of those uh, needs. Okay. Great. Thank you. Yeah, Joe. I have a question from Meredith. Uh, is there specific language that states a sidewalk technically terminates if it if there's a crosswalk there across the road to a new section of sidewalk that continues on? Because it doesn't seem to me that the sidewalk even terminates there. And if we can make that determination, then this doesn't apply. Um. You have the exact same language I have. And like I said, this is the very first time this has ever been triggered. Um, so I, 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 like, I like what you're asking because you're What's saying what, what constitutes connectivity, right? Like is a crosswalk that gets us from one spot to another, does that create adequate connectivity such and that it, this wouldn't apply? Um, right. And in fact, if you look at the site, like they said, the slopes there are very steep. Uh, there are utility poles that actually cross over at that location so that the utility poles are now where the sidewalk isn't. So in order to keep the sidewalk going, it just doesn't, from an engineering point of view, it doesn't make any sense to build it on that side of the road, which is why I suspect there's a crosswalk there and it goes over to the other side of the road. And that way also the, con the connection then is to the other public buildings up at the top of the hill. Whereas if the sidewalk continued up the other side of the road, they'd still have to cross the road to access the college. So I, I just, I was wondering if we can make that determination that the sidewalk doesn't terminate there. There's a crosswalk, pedestrian access isn't hindered and we could just move on. Yeah, Joe, I, I appreciate that thinking. I think it's, it's appropriate to ask what is, what's the definition of terminate um, is, is I think what you're getting at. Um, I would, as much as I'd like to resolve this tonight, I think I would feel more comfortable if Meredith passes along that very good question and observation um, to be folded into consideration by Department of Public Works. Um, Meredith, did you want to jump in as well? Nope, it's, uh, you guys wrapped it up. I think, I think running that language about the termination by Public Works as well as maybe City Council, as you said, mm -hmm. city attorneys, um, makes a lot of sense to see if you we can hang our hat on that okay thank you joe i think that 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 was very close to being an elegant solution i'm not i'm just not sure i feel comfortable in making that interpretation right now that's i think it's the right okay. sort of analysis thank you okay um i feel like we've done as much as we can on this for tonight um and i'd like to move on to the other parts of the staff report okay all right Thank you very much. All right, so that brings us to page 11 of the staff report at the bottom is landscaping and screening, um, which is required for all applications except changes of use where sites have previously been developed according to an approved site plan and where the proposed development will not change or be required to change any landscaping or screening. So there isn't a landscaping plan, we've heard um, testimony that screening is in the form of um, the design of the porch being away from the commercial building um, and that there are um, blinds in the windows, shades in the windows to create privacy. And we've also heard that there is a, a, a grade differential that would make screening with anything but a full grown tree somewhat challenging. Um, we are talking about a change of use, but the structures are basically remaining in the same footprint. The site's not changing a whole lot. Um, but we also know that if there's a change of use in the, say that there's a more intensive use of the commercial building at some time, that will not trigger an opportunity to, to put landscaping in at that time. So that, that's kind of what we are considering. Um, so, Ward, beyond what you've testified, um, are there any other options for screening the residential building from the commercial building? Um, I don't really see them. One slight further point on the deck is that the way we designed it is that where people would sit and enjoy the outdoor weather is actually shielded by the shed. So as you look at the building, the shed presents a facade 
and then you would actually go around it to behind it to sit, you know, and and hang out. And so essentially anybody that sat on their deck um, would actually be invisible from not only the parking lot and people walking to the commercial building, but entirely invisible from the commercial building. So as you said earlier, I think we very conscientiously used the design of the building to effectively screen the use of the new from the old. And the buildings are only about 20 feet apart. And as I said, both are, um, I mean, especially the garage is so tall that there really isn't a way to screen the building from the other practically, except removing the windows from that, that entire facade, which I just think would be cold and unacceptable design. Okay. Um, are there questions from board members about screening or um, opinions about whether we need to require any landscaping or screening beyond what has been suggested? Okay. So I'm seeing that the board is satisfied with the screening as, as presented in the, in the design. Thank you. Um, as for outdoor lighting, it looks like the thing that we still need a little more information on is just as part of the final packet is confirm the lumen output for the new outdoor fixture. I don't know if that's something you have with you now or if it can be provided later. No, I'm very happy to do it. And I know we just need to uh, not have night sky illumination and that's standard and I can choose a, an exterior fixture that complies with that and submit that in a timely fashion. Great, thanks for it. Yep. Um, outdoor seating, display, or storage are not applicable. Solar access, um, not applicable to minor site plans. Same with design and compatibility, as Meredith explained earlier. So um, we are now on for page 14 of the staff report. We've determined that we are the structure being demolished is not historic. Um, we've discussed that we need more information about the public sidewalk requirement and how to proceed with that. But the applicant has requested a waiver. We need more information from Public Works on that, too. Um, and we've determined that no additional landscaping or screening is required. Um, do board members have anything else they need or want to know about this project, aside from the sidewalk stuff? All right. Um, and Yana or Ward, is there anything that you would like to add um, on topics other than the sidewalk? Nope, I'm good. No, thank you. Okay, thanks. So I think what we would do is entertain a motion to continue this application to a time and date certain in order to obtain the information we need about the public sidewalk requirement. Um, before that motion is made, I would ask um, Ward and Yana whether um, our next meeting or the meeting after would be preferable. So our next meeting is two weeks from today. And <clears throat> our meeting after that is, Meredith, do you have your calendar closer August, than I have mine? August 3rd. August 3rd. Well, so yeah, I, can say for, yeah. I can just say that my life is so freaking exciting these days that I can do both. <laughs> <laughs> Woo! <laughs> I just, yeah, it's going to be true. funny there. I have no plans to go anywhere, so I'll do either, but we might as well do the sooner, if okay. possible. Do you think do that. DPW will be ready with, the, with their opinion in two weeks? Um, I, I am not, you know, I, I don't know for sure. I would assume that they would be able to, if for some reason they can't you could ask to, to move it to August 3rd and that's that's never scheduling issue um, I will say that there are two new applications on the agenda for July 20th right now that you would cut but you would get ahead of that okay Joe uh, I see here in the staff report that uh, before making a motion part number two whether to waive the public sidewalk requirement um, so does that mean that we can vote to waive the sidewalk requirement and make a motion to simply approve the project and waive the sidewalk requirement? And so they wouldn't have to come back in two weeks? Mm. That's a good question, Joe. I believe that in order for us to grant a waiver, it says um, on 3-57 of our zoning that we may, any request 
for a waiver by the applicants shall include a recommendation in support of that waiver from the director of public works. And I, I, the way I read that is that in order to grant for the DRB to grant a waiver, the waiver needs to be requested and supported by DPW. Is is that? Yeah, I understand. I don't. I'm still new to the board. I don't really know all the procedural questions or issues. That's okay. Um, that thing that I just read to you, it's the second time I've ever read it. So that this whole section is new to all of us. So you're asking good questions. I don't, and I don't mind a bit. We're just okay. trying to know our options. So I wrote I'm glad for you the that. second meeting, not the July 20th, but the next one, if we can be on that one. Okay. So you want the okay. August 3rd, Yana? Yep. Did you say August 3rd? Yes. Okay. Okay. Work, works for okay. me. Great. I would entertain a motion to continue. I move that we continue this application to um, August 3rd. I second. Okay, we have a motion. A motion second. from Roger, a second. Second, that. A second from everybody. Um, I think I saw Gene first. I'm going to go with that. Um, is there any discussion? All right, I will take the roll call. Uh, please say yay or nay in response to the motion. Roger? Yes. Gene? Yes. Rob? Yes. Joe? Yes. And I also vote yes. Um, the application has been continued to our August, our first August meeting. Uh, thank you very much. All thank right. Thank you. We'll see you then. Great. So just a couple other items of business on our agenda here tonight. Um, item eight is to review our minutes from June 15th. Um, are there any corrections to the minutes? Okay. If not, I would entertain a motion. Okay. Did we lose Rob? Uh, yeah, I think we did. <laughs> well, phooey. Uh, we may not be able to vote on the minute. Oh, nope. Rob, give me just a second. We'll give Rob just a second. No problem. No problem. Hey, Rob. I made it. Did I make it? I made it, made it sound like we were done there. Sorry about that. We're just voting on the minutes. There's been a motion in a second to approve the minutes of June 15th. And those eligible to vote are myself, Rob, Joe, and Roger, and Jean. So we're all eligible to vote. So is there any discussion? OK, I'll call uh, the roll to the approval. If, if I can yep. vote to approve if I wasn't here for half of it. You may abstain if, if you want. Um, okay, I want to make sure it still passes, though, if we have the minimum number. We have, we have oh, enough. thank you. Okay. We do have enough. You, yeah, you're welcome for right. staying. You don't want your first act of rebellion to be voting down the minutes of June 15th. No, Fair that's enough. not how I want to be remembered. <laughs> <laughs> Appreciate that. All right, we'll go ahead and call the roll. Um, no, sorry, Roger. Just for, oh, yes? Just for note taking, who actually made the motion? Um, motion by Roger, second by Jean. Uh, okay, I thought that was the right. motion to continue. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. You're right. All right. Um, I'd entertain a motion to approve the minutes. I'll move. Moved by Rob. Second. Second by Roger. Thank you. Any discussion? All right, we'll take a vote. Roger. Yes. Jean. Yes. Joe. I will abstain. Rob. Yes. And I also vote yes. We have uh, we have approved the minutes. All right. Um, other business, I would just like to um, point out that um, we are looking for members for the DRB. So now that you've experienced it, you'll want to tell your friends to join in. 
Um, so applications can be submitted to, um, if you get in touch with Meredith Crandall, she will point you in the right direction on how to apply. It's pretty straightforward. We're looking for people with all kinds of experience and interest, and um, we have permanent positions um, available. So please tell your friends and listeners at home, viewers at home, join us. Um, there's no other business. Do others have announcements? All right. With that, I will take a motion to adjourn. So moved. I move. Motion by Roger. Second by Rob. Taking the roll. Roger. Yes. Gene. Yes. Joe. Yes. Rob. Yes. And I also vote yes. We are adjourned. Thank you all very, very much. We'll see you next time.